In this video, I'm going to walk you through the post-lab assignment for lab 9, Kinetics of the Iodine Clock. This is actually a really tricky post-lab assignment, so it's probably going to take me a while to go through this, but don't give up on me. So on this ex uh, in this lab, you performed three different experiments, one, two, and three. They were all using the same chemicals with just slightly different amounts of each one. The first thing that you're going to do on your post-lab assignment is to recalculate the molarity of some of the substances that you used in those three experiments, not all, just some. So first, data table is going to be pertaining to experiment number one. And again, what we're doing here is recalculating the molarities of some of the solutions, the iodide, the thiosulfate, and the porosulfate. So what we're going to do is refer ourselves to experiment number one. That's going to help us fill this table out. And it is asking us to report the volume that we used for these three substances. That's going to be the Ki, and the S2O3 and the NH42SO8. Um, in this data table, I'm not writing the formulas of the cations. So Ki is the same thing as I minus, S2O, S2O3 2 minus is the same thing as Na2, S2O3, you get the idea. So we're going to begin by just reporting the volume that we used for each one of these three substances. And we need to report that in liters. The experiment number one procedure had us using point zero zero one liters or one milliliter of ki and also s2 o3 2 minus and we used two milliliters of the per sulfate 0 0.002 liters we're also going to report in this data table the molarity the initial molarity of each one of these solutions and that comes from up here in the preparation part um, so we have our Ki, which started out as 0.2 molar. And the S2O3, which is right there, that is 0 0.005 molar. And the S2O8, which is 0.1. Oops, 0.1. In the next column, we're going to calculate the moles of each one of these three ions, and we're going to do that by using the molarity to convert from liters into moles. So for the calculation for this, we're just going to simply multiply these two numbers by each other to get the moles. Um, and if you have forgotten exactly what we're doing here, I'm just going to kind of show the work down here. Point, point 0.2 molar means that we have point 0.2 moles um, for the first substance, we have got 0.2 moles of Ki for every one liter of solution. And if we multiply by the volume of the solution in liters, those liter units will cancel out. And what we're left with is moles. So that's what we're going to fill into this box right here. And then the next thing that we're going to do is report the total solution volume after everything gets mixed. Now, some students at this point get a little bit confused and they just add these three volumes up. But don't forget that you had more than just those three substances in that um, beaker in, for experiment number one. So at this, point, at this point, when we're trying to calculate the total solution volume, we want to consider all of the different substances that we put together in that beaker. Even though they're not all being used in this data table, they all contribute to the volume. Now we're not gonna take into consideration the two drops of starch because that's a really small amount. We're just gonna be focusing on the larger volumes. One plus one plus one plus two. One plus one plus one plus two. That's a total volume of five milliliters or in liters, that's going to be 0 0.005. And that's the same for all of these guys. So they were all mixed together. They all ended up with that same total volume. Now, the last thing that we're going to do on this data table is calculate the molarity of each one of these substances with their new volumes. And to do that, we're just going to be simply taking the moles, actually, let me write it like this. We're going to take the moles and we're going to divide it by the volume in liter. And that's going to give us this number right here. And again, that's just going to be the moles of Ki divided by the 0 0.005 liters. Um, that's going to give us the new molarity of Ki, and we'll repeat that for all three of the substances that we used in experiment number one. Once you get that data table done, you're going to do the exact same thing for experiment number two. So we want to consult the procedure for experiment number two because the volumes have changed a little bit. Um, 
the molarities haven't, the initial molarities haven't changed. This should be the same, but you'll have different volumes, which means you'll have different numbers of moles and you'll have different molarities over here on the end. But the procedure, again, the steps that you take for completing this data table, exactly the same as the steps you take up here. And then you'll do it one more time for experiment number three, using the data for experiment number three. So you've got new volumes that you're gonna use, which means you'll have new moles and new molarities. Once you get all three of those done, you are going to start working on um, kind of compiling all of that data into one data table. So now over here, we have experiment number one, two, and three, and I'm just gonna kind of add as a reference, experiment number one data is all in question number one from the post lab. Um, so over here, right there, and experiment number two data, that's all in question number two of the post lab, and experiment number three, that's all in question number three. Now this data table is having us focus uh, again on the I minus, the S203, and the S208. And what we're gonna be doing here is reporting the molarities that we calculated in each one of these data tables. So I've got over here, my experiment number one data table is pulled up. That's what I'm gonna be using to fill out this first part of question number four. The molarity after mixing for I minus is what I'm gonna be reporting in this box right here. And the molarity after mixing for S2O3 is what I will report in this box right here. And then the molarity after mixing for S2O8, that's what I'm gonna report in this box. For question number two, I'm gonna do the same thing using my data table for question number two. And for question number three, um, that data, or for experiment number three, I'll be using the data from question number three. Also in this data table, you will be reporting the two times of the trials that you capped for each one of these experiments and then calculating the average time. This, of course, is going to be taking, uh, done by taking the first and second times, adding them together and dividing it by two. And that's how you're going to get your average for each one of these different things. Now, once you get all of that done, we're going to move on to the last page. Um, and this is where we're going to be calculating the rate and the rate law for this experiment, for this reaction. Now up here, this is um, just kind of explaining exactly what's happening in the experiment. It's a two-step reaction, which means you've got two, ex two different chemical reactions that are taking place inside that test tube. First, the iodide ion is converted into the I2 molecule. So this is iodide and this is iodine. I'm just gonna call it I2. And then the I2 molecule reacts immediately with the S2O3 that you put into the, um, into the beaker and that converts it back into iodide. Now, eventually you're gonna run out of S2O3. Eventually all of the S2O3 is gonna get used up. And when that happens, when there's no more S2O3, the I2 reacts with the starch, the two drops of starch that you added to the beaker, and that converts the starch into a really dark blue color. So when you see the blue color present, that blue color is telling you that there is no more S2O3 for the reaction anymore. And instead of this reaction taking place, because all the S2O3 is gone, now this reaction has started taking place. So this dark blue color change is a way of visually letting us know that there is no more S2O3 present in the beaker. Let's keep that in mind and let's move down to the data table for experiment number one, two, and three. So the first thing that you're gonna be reporting in this experiment is the initial concentration of S2O32 minus for each one of these different trials. Now don't get confused. It is not like literally the initial. So we're not going all the way back here and pulling this number. We want the initial amount in the beaker before the reaction started. So for experiment number one, um, we're gonna pull it off of this data table right here. We're gonna be taking this data from this spot right here. So this, whatever this molarity is, that is going to be our initial S2O3 for experiment number one. This is our initial S2O3 for experiment number two, and this is for experiment number three. 
So that's where all of this data comes from. Now the final S203 concentration, when the dark blue color, the final uh, appears, the final concentration is always gonna be a zero. The dark blue color appears because this amount has gone down to zero. So for all of these, it's a zero. The change in time, delta T, this is referring to the amount of time that it takes for you to go from the initial amount down to zero, and that you're gonna obtain from question number four, the average time of the reaction. So whatever this number is, that's what you're gonna stick into this box. Now the last spot here, you're gonna be calculating the average rate for each one of these experiments. When you do this, do not forget to include the stoichiometric coefficient for thiosulfate. We're calculating the average rate for the, th the thiosulfate, that's tricky to say, for the thiosulfate ion, the average rate calculation for anything is going to be one over that substance's stoichiometric coefficient. And for thiosulfate, the stoichiometric coefficient is two. So we're gonna go one over two times the change in concentration of thiosulfate, S2O32 minus, divided by the change in time. And that's what we're going to use to calculate this average rate. The change in, actually, I think what I'm gonna do is just make this a little easier to see. I'm gonna move it down here, even though it doesn't really belong here. Um, so the change in concentration of S2O3, that's gonna be the change in concentration from the initial to the final. Um, so whatever you started with here, whatever you ended up with is zero. Uh, the difference between these two numbers, that's what you're going to plug in right here. And your change in time is this number right here. Uh, don't forget, again, don't forget the one half. That's going to get plugged in as your average rate. Don't expect all of these rates to be the same. They probably won't be because you have different amounts for these different experiments. But this will give you the average rate for all three of them. So once you get that done, I'm going to just kind of scoot this up here shrink it up a little bit, fit it in the box. Once you get the average rate calculated, the last thing that you're going to do is calculate the rate law for the reaction. Now the general rate law is rate equals k i minus to the x S2O8, not 3, S2O8 to the Y. And here, what we're going to be doing is following the same technique that you've learned in class. So when you have three sets of data, experiment number one, experiment number two, and experiment number three, you need to find two experiments where, let's just start with I minus, find two experiments where the concentration of I minus stays the same. Now, don't look here because that data that you need is not here. The data that you need is over here in question number four. So for experiment one, two, and three, find two experiments where the concentration of I minus stays the same. Let's say that it's one and two. You're gonna plug in, you're gonna, remember you're gonna set this up like a fraction. Okay, I minus X S two O eight two minus to the Y. So let's say that we're choosing experiment number one and two. You're going to plug in the molarities of I minus for each one of these. You're going to plug in the concentration of S2O8 for each one of these. You're going to use the rate from this data table right here. So you're going to plug in the rate and plug in the rate. And then you're going to do whatever cancellations you need to do and solve for y. And then you'll repeat that process again, just like we've learned in class, just like we've done in class, um, to solve for the other exponent as well. This will give you the rate law. Now the one thing, like I said, the one thing you've gotta be really careful about is the O8 versus the O3. S2, O3 is being used to calculate the average rate, which is showing up here. The I minus is showing up in the rate law and the S2O8 is showing up in the rate law as well.